does to Smith. Jamari for three and the win. Yeah! He got it! We are here to feel Rock's newest Rocket Fuel podcast. Of course, I'm your co host, LaShar Binkley. You can always find me on Twitter at Binkley Hoops, and you can find my written work over at SB Nation or the Dream Shake. And before we introduce our, our guests, I'll let our, our guests introduce themselves. I want to give my co host a chance to let you know where to find all his great work. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's Vader. You can find me on Instagram and also Twitter, now known as X at Vader Sports uh, for Rockets related news, some text and stuff, a little bit of Astro stuff. And of course, as you see, I mean, if you're in the Rockets Twitter verse or anywhere around Rockets basketball, you already know these two people that are joining us today. But I want to give them a chance to introduce themselves because you already know they're doing great work out there. So yeah, well, yeah. I'll, I'll go real quick and pass it off to you. Yeah, so for me, um, Brado NBA Instagram, Twitter, you know, TikTok, all that good stuff. You know, of course, Rockets news, uh, a little bit of Texas in there as well, as Bader said. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where you can find my stuff. I also have the Brad and Will show on YouTube, of course, with my co-host Will. So I'll let him introduce his stuff right now. That's good. Yeah. I appreciate you all for having me on the show today. Um, y'all can find me oh, on Instagram, Twitter at Bias Houston. Um, Brad talked about the podcast. I guess the one cool thing I'll plug as well is the, um, the playback room, um, Houston live rooms, playback app, playback website. Um, we, we were in there watching the games live. So. Hey, you know, that's really where you can find us these days. And real quick on the playback, that's actually in partnership with the NBA, which is you know really cool. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, and like it, it's you know it's just I think it's the um, I think it's a better medium, um, yeah. in terms of like consuming the game than like a space would be, uh, just because you you can kind of do it more. I feel like people feel more involved that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a it's a great time. Um, we we always have fun in there. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And again, I was telling Brad before we jumped on, I was like, man, it's it's been a while since we we all talked because, you know, we used to kind of be in the same group back in the day. Uh, it seems like 10 years ago, but it was only like two or three years ago. But it, it's really good to see y'all, you know, on the come up doing big things. So, man, it's really good to see. I appreciate you, man. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I kind of want to start off. We're going to have two segments today. The first segment, of course, we want to talk a little bit about the Utah game last night where the Rockets won their 11th game in a row. Uh, that's now 13 out of 14. They have won. There's still a game behind Golden State, who won again also last night. Uh, the Rockets will be taking on the Dallas Mavericks on Sunday. Of course, that's going to be a huge game at Toyota Center. The Mavericks also won six in a row. Um, so the first segment, we're going to be talking a little bit about that Utah game and also if the Rockets can catch Golden State. And then the second segment, I mean, of course, we have to talk about Jalen Green, who has been the hottest player in the NBA uh, pretty much for, for the entire month of March. Uh, we're definitely going to be talking about that and a little bit about the, as usual, rumors coming out about should you get rid of Jalen Green or Alperen Shangoon. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in the second segment. But I want to start off with, of course, the game last night where the Rockets, uh, kind of a similar pattern to where they were against Portland and against um, a couple of the other lesser teams where they started off a little bit slow. And then eventually they were able to pick it up in the second half, especially because of Jalen Green's huge third quarter. So I'll start with you, Brad. What did you think of last night's game? And what does it say about the Rockets that they can uh, pretty much flip a switch and you know go from where they lack a day's goal in the first half and in the second half you start to see more of the Rockets basketball we've been seeing lately? Yeah, so the biggest thing for me is the big switch from we can go back to you know January. It was the start of when the Rockets would – get into these big, you know, deficits, they would come back and then end up losing the games, right? And now we see them fighting back on the road, you know, down however many points and come back and win a game. And it's most important you have a guy who can will yourself to victories, and that being Jalen Green. You know, his last eight road games, he's averaging over 30 points a game. Um, and again, you know, on the road fighting back, this was a team, like, seven road games ago, they were 5-24 and 24 on the road. You know, they were tied with the Pistons for the worst road record in the NBA, and now they've rattled off, you know, seven straight road wins. So, you know, just looking at the game yesterday, it's great to see Jalen go out there, score 30 points in the second half after a terrible um, scoring first half, only four points in that first half. You know, that second half, I mean, he came out the gate four for four, 10 points in the first three minutes. And, you know, down the stretch, he's a guy you can go to. He's getting doubles. You can facilitate to other guys. Um, and, yeah, he's just – he's a presence out there. Um, he looks every bit of a star um, right now. And that's what we saw uh, with Jalen, you know, willing them back to victory. But yeah, that's, it was just impressive. I mean, that's what I would say on that topic. Like, it was it was a great win, you know, regardless of who you're playing. You know, the Jazz play better at home, so 
yeah. again, it's, just, it's a good win, especially a team that's fighting for a playing spot. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and Will, I want to ask you the same question because we know that once you blow a team out, especially just a few games ago, and now you're playing them on their home court, they're going to play a lot tougher. And that's exactly what happened. So what did you see from the Rockets last night? Um, I mean, I think Brad kind of summarized it really well. I think the biggest thing that I saw, um, I had to boil it down to just um, one person. But for me, like this with this whole stretch, um, it's just for me. What stood out to me the most is just the growth from from Jalen Green as a, as a player down the stretch. Right, this is like the third or fourth game now, um, especially these last two, where well, one the defense, uh, the opposing team's defense is just stop Jalen Green. Like that's that's kind of been the, the consistent theme lately. Is they they don't want him to get it going, especially when he starts getting hot. Then it starts you start seeing him start throwing more traps and doubles his way and trying to force him to get off the ball. Um, but this is like, like I said, the third or fourth game, especially like in crunch time now, these last two games where um, we've been in a, a do or die. Like these are all must win games for us, which is trying to make that playing tournament. So these are these are high stakes games that mean something. And um, in the, cr- the, the, the crunch time, you see that the Rockets are just giving Jalen Green the ball and saying, all right, bring us home. And to me, that means a lot, especially knowing where he started this season and, and how it was. Um, you know, there was there was times where we were better off without him on the floor uh, in crunch time. So like now it's like not only is he on the floor, he's the reason we're winning in crunch time. Like we're giving him the ball and telling him to bring us home. And there's not that many guys in the NBA who can do that on a consistent basis and and do it to the degree that he's doing it right now. Um, like that, that's special to me. Um, and so, yeah, like, I think that's what stood out to me the most is just how, how well he's been able to deal with the pressure of being, of like leading a team in, in the clutch and he's doing it really, really well. Um, and then I, you know, I want to shout out to Men Thompson as well. I think he's been playing really well over these last few stretches. He doesn't, you know, do anything that necessarily like, you know, screams the box scores either the same way that Jalen does, but it's, it's the consistently good play, um, you know, he, on, on defense and then he, he's a, he's a, a rebounding machine. He, you know, we was watching the game yesterday, and I'm, I'm watching. I'm like, man, I think I'm having a rough game. And I look at the box score, and he has was like 18 points on yeah. 58 truths. I'm like, wow, like, I guess not. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, um, you know, just shout out to you. I think those two specifically that really stood out to me the most uh, during this run. Yeah, Will, I agree with you because I'm like watching these games, and I posted. I don't know if it was yesterday or this morning, but. One thing about Jalen Green is that I never doubted his his talent. I, I always thought that eventually he'd figure it out. I didn't know if he would figure it out here. I'm thankful that it looks like he he finally is. But um, one thing that I was not sure about Jalen Green was whether or not he had that dog. I didn't know if he had like the that will to win to like that. You see all the great players be able to just kind of backpack their team to a to a victory. Like when it looks like they're gonna lose, they're just able to like you know, flip that switch and, and be that superstar, be the best player on the floor. And we've seen two games in a row where Jalen Green has just kind of willed this team to victory. And so, like, that's been, like, my biggest takeaway from this. It's, it's not been, like, necessarily the scoring outbursts. Uh, it's been the it's been the passes that he's been making uh, in conjunction with the defense, in conjunction with he just wants it, dog. He, he got off that airplane in OKC, and he caught it. He was, like, 10 in a row. We're trying to win 10 in a row. We, we're making this plan push. And he didn't just he didn't just talk it. He went out there and walked it. And like so for me, uh, the the Jalen Green people like we, we've been talking about it. People have been saying like, well, he's been doing this every year the last two years. Right. No, this is this is not the same. This is not the same, bro. Like yeah. if, if, you're, if you're saying this is the same, I kind of feel like that's a casual take um, because you're not looking at all the other ways that he's impacting the game. You're not looking at the ways. Uh, People used to always like rag on him for his plus minus being so bad. Well, now he has he has like one of the best plus minuses in the league. Uh, Brad, correct me if I'm wrong. It might be the best like over this stretch. Um, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah but it's like, dude, dude is doing everything that you you could ask a player from his position to do, and he's locking up guys. He's getting steals. He's getting blocks. Um, he's he's creating open shots for other guys. It's not like he's just going out there and shot checking. And trying to um, you know shoot shoot us to a victory, like he's playing a complete game. He and and as a person who like um, has believed in him the whole time, like he's exceeding my expectations. Like I did not think, you know, I, I just thought he'd be like an alpha scorer when we drafted him. You know, I kind of was resigned to the fact that maybe he wasn't not going to be like a complete player. You know, as far as rebounding, assisting, playing defense, but he's shown during this stretch that he can do all those things. So like for me, it's no going back. 
Um, I think like he's shown what kind of player he can be. And so now the expect the bar to me has been raised even higher. Yeah. Oh, and, and one, oh, lastly, before we go to the next thing, but like I'm in Thompson. <laughs> I'm in Thompson, man. Like that dude is uh been playing like out of position and he's embraced like Emi Doke has kind of coached him up and we wanted to make him a screener. Um, I was looking at some stuff today because I was kind of putting together a highlight uh, for him, highlight reel for him. And, you know, he's doing a lot of stuff out of like this like split action scissor kind of thing at the top of the key where he's getting like Jalen a lot of open shots. And um, like this is just not even the way I imagined the Rockets would utilize him when they drafted him. You know, I kind of thought he would be an impact player, but the way they're the way MA has had to imp- deploy him, you know, over this stretch of wins is just kind of like open my eyes. Like he can be he he's he's positionless. He can probably kind of do a little bit of everything. So uh, my biggest takeaway from this winning streak, just other than Jalen, has been like this, the strides that Amin Thompson has made uh, being a starter. And he just slid right into that position. And he at, in most of these games, he's been our second best player. Yeah. yeah and actually, as you bring up, uh, you know, um, I want to actually talk a little bit about uh, Coach Udoka and how he's kind of implemented some of these players because a lot of times that may kind of get lost in the shuffle kind of watching Jalen Green doing his thing out there but I think the biggest thing with Amin earlier was that he was not necessarily in the wrong position but a lot of times you saw him he was camped out at three-point line like you said Vader now he's more in the dunker spot he's setting picks what what have y'all seen from 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 coach that has been the biggest difference or do you have have y'all seen any change during this winning streak because we all know like the Rockets struggled from like January to uh, the end of February where they didn't win back-to-back games that entire time. So have y'all seen any change for what MA's doing on the court or is just more a fact that yeah, now Jalen is becoming a Jalen that everybody wanted him to be and also that the Rockets are playing this a lot better overall as a team? I'll say the one difference that I've noticed um, with this winning streak, uh, I'll speak on Amin Thompson in particular, um, this this is the one benefit I would say um, with Opera and Shane Goodout. You have Amin Thompson who's able to be that, you know, screen and roll guy who can just, you know, instead of picking screen and, and roll to the basket, obviously you can't do that with Opera and Shane Goodout there. But he's been benefiting a lot, you know, doing that. Um, Jalen Green's getting double team. He kicks it to a man um, in that short roll. He can either kick it out to the corner or he's crafty enough to get a layup because he's also athletic enough to hang around the rim and, you know, create his own layup. Um, so, yeah, I would say that, that's been a big difference. Um, of course, a, a huge difference is Jalen Green. He was not hitting his open threes before. Now he's all of a sudden hitting all of his threes. So th- those are the, the two biggest things that I've necessarily seen. And, um, yeah, I think there's just a lot more movement. The pace, um, again, it increased after the All-Star break. Um, that's That's been consistent, you know, despite who's been in the lineup. I think those have been the biggest, you know, changes overall. But, yeah, of, of course, just a, having an emerging star – Obviously, you know, it, it pushes them over the edge. and I, That's probably the main difference. But, yeah, I would say, that, like I said, the biggest thing I've seen is what Ben Thompson moving a lot more off ball instead of just being camped out in the corner at the three-point line. You know, Will and I, you know, even Vader, you know, on the playback, we would complain about why is Ben Thompson camped out at the three-point yeah. line? We need to see him doing something. And now he's constantly moving, it looks like, and he's always in the right place at the right time, which is how he was able to get those eight offensive rebounds yesterday. Um, and he's been able to, you know, score a lot better as well, especially in the paint. Yeah, well, and what about you? Have you seen a difference in inmates' coaching style, or is it like what Brad said? It's pretty much like, I mean, it kind of boils down to you, you see a better Jalen Green, but we also see more movement from our men. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I know it sounds, it's like not the fun answer, but I, I really think it's just Jalen Green playing at a better level. Um, yeah. uh, we, we, we were saying all season long that, like, the, the common phrase was, we're a Jalen Green leap away. And like some of the, a lot of the the numbers, like when you look at the events and it looks, a lot of that backs that up to that like Jalen was kind of the missing piece, especially considering like when you looked at what what this Rockets team was missing when they were, um, you know, earlier this season, but what they were missing um, was a guy who does a lot of what Jalen Green is now doing. That was the, what they were, what they were, they were just missing that guy who could knock down open shots, create his own shot, you know, come off some screens, maybe make some stuff happen that way. Like, that's what they were missing. And that's what Jalen Green is doing right now. Um, and so, like, I, I don't want to say, like, he, it's just Jalen Green was bad. Jaylen, now Jalen Green's good. So the Rockets are not good. Like, I think that's kind of make, makes it a little bit too simple. But I think that the, the biggest thing is that Jalen Green is playing it. Like, he's playing it. I think you could you could make an argument right now that he's playing, like, the best player in the NBA. And I don't think that's a hot take. I don't think that's, like, a – you know, like a super duper, like out of left field kind of thing. Like if you look at what he's been doing over this month, 
it's hard to argue there's been someone who's who's consistently playing at a higher level um and uh who's just like absolutely willing because I, I think that's what's happening I, with all due respect to, like forever and lead and i'm going to show you yesterday yesterday's game ball once again goes to Jalen. um yeah. and so like I, I think that's what it is but also like brad talked about i do think that um a men thompson is someone who just impacts winning on a level that sometimes isn't even quantifiable in the box score um and so i think also having him out there the they're pushing the the pace with the men in jail on the fast break and stuff like that i think all that kind of adds up and we we start having these you know uh, wins that we didn't have earlier this year and i'll piggyback kind of off what you said will as far as uh i think i don't want to misquote uh rafael stone but i know he 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 basically said uh on paper, theoretically, Jalen Green is exactly what this team needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so now you're seeing it, like it, you, you're seeing like the vision. Like he had a vision when he drafted these guys of what they what their roles would be, and um, you know Jalen Green's uh, leap actually, like we we've been saying this, and I feel like we have to keep saying it. It started to happen before Afrin Shingun even got got injured. Uh, since the injury, though, like I think Ime Adoka has been forced to be more creative. When you have a guy as good as Afrin Shingun. It's easy to like, hey, let me just get the ball down to that dude because I know yeah, he's yeah. going to generate offense for me. He's going to either get a good shot for himself or he's going to make a good decision and kick it out to a, to a wide open shooter. And now that he does not have that crutch, I think that it has kind of benefited some of the other guys because we haven't been super relying on Fred Van Vliet picking roles. And and we all know we, we, we like Fred Van Vliet. He's a good shooter. He's a good leader. Uh, but like, I think he was just being overused. He's being overutilized, like some of the best things that he can do. Uh, we were kind of getting away from those things. And you saw like in the game last night, Jalen Green ran point guard uh, a lot of that game, right? Yeah. And we weren't seeing that before and maybe in spurts, but like Jalen Green ran ran point guard for a lot of that game. He was kind of responsible for like, you know, putting pressure on the defense, trying to get paint touches, uh, you know, being the guy that's kicking it out to the other guys. And then I think it also made him be more creative with what uh, we are seeing with Amin Thompson. He, he's in the dunker spot at times, depending on what they're running. But he's not just in the dunker spot or he's not camped out at the three point line where he's basically useless. I mean, let's just be honest, dude shooting like under like 18 percent from three this yeah. season. Um, and so, like, he's not really a threat from the three point line. So to kind of have him be out at the three point line to me when he's such a good athlete, such a good passer, such a good roller, such a good screener. It's just kind of like you're you, you're not utilizing a weapon that you have. And so, like, yeah, I think Ime's adapted, and that just goes to like, that's what good coaches do. Like, your 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 best player went down, and you're still trying to win games. Uh, figure it out, and and Ime's been figuring it out. And so, like, um, I think we were really worried at sometimes because we like, man, Ime got out coached, and we haven't. When's the last time we said Ime got out coached? It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask you what you said, Vader? Um, the the one thing you, you talked about uh, Jalen playing point guard a lot uh, more recently. I want to add that, like, a narrative that used to, like, drive me crazy on Rockets Twitter um, was that, like, Fred Van Vliet was holding him back or that Fred <laughs> Van Vliet was, like, a ball yeah. rock or something. And I'm like, Brady, you know, Brad, y'all know, because I the playback, I'm not the world's biggest Fred guy. Like, I think I think he's been a great addition to this team. I think we're, we're a lot better with him than without him. But I think he's very, he's very limited in what he can and cannot do. But that being said, like, I don't see how you can watch what's happening this season and walk away with that conclusion. And I, I was saying it all, like, the whole year, I, I kept kind of trying to hammer this point home, that Fred was only on ball, and it come it came off this ball hogging, but he was only doing that because if he didn't, how are we getting to our sets? Well, what were we doing? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Who who on this team could consistently hit Shingo and Shingo spots who was, like, the only guy who was really doing something for us earlier. And I want you to finish your thought, Will. I'm not trying to hear but, like, last night, Jalen Green went nuclear in the, sec in the third quarter, right, 20 points. When he went to the bench, Fred went nuclear, right? Yeah. When Jalen came back in the game, he deferred that's to Jalen again. That's the point I was going to make. The point I was making is that Fred only – only the only time Fred gets into those give me the ball and get out the way kind of uh, bags is when he has to. When it's like, if we don't do this, what else are we going to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all be finna throw the ball to Dylan Brooks in the post and maybe he turned like Kobe fadeaways. Like, what do, what do you do if, if – if, you know what I'm saying? If nobody else has it going – and the offense needs something. What do you what do you do? So Fred's like, all right, well, I'm making the big money. I'm the leader of this team. I'm gonna go out there. I'm gonna put some shots up. And like that's when it happens. But you'll see every single time that Jalen Green has it going, Fred gets off the ball. Fred does not try to go out there and hey, give me the rock. Let me let me see it, young blood. Like he gets out the way. He, he lets he lets Jalen do his thing. 
He did the same thing with Shingo earlier this year. So it's like when when like when they have it going, Fred is a a more than willing off ball player. And I I hate the fact that like there was people out there saying that like he was ball hogging or that he was holding guys back. Like that's not. I don't say you can watch these games, and that's the conclusion you walk away with. And lastly, one thing I also want to mention, I think we've seen a little bit more five out stuff, obviously, because, I mean, if Jabari's at the five, you're going to see the floor lifted a little bit more. And I think um, it's, it's they don't do it all the time. Right. But like when they do do that, I think it, it just for a guard, I mean, it naturally creates more space for you to like get into the lane. So those are those are some things that I want to see, like when, when Shingun does come back. Um, Ime's gonna have to kind of like mix it up, like a like a good pitcher in baseball, right? Like a good offense in football. You know, mix it up. You got to mix the run in the pass in order to be like a good, you know, a successful team. So like, you know, we can have the Shingun post ups. We can have the you know Shingun, you know, you know high post stuff. But like also, you know, at times it's okay to like run some five out stuff and uh, get Jalen going downhill. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I kind of one more thing before we move on to the uh, Golden State topic, uh, what Will was saying about uh, the narrative around Fred Van Vliet kind of being a ball hog. And, and that's absolutely true as far as the reason why he was being a ball hog. Because like you said, once when we saw it earlier when Fred Van Vliet was out those games due to injury, uh, the Rockets just pretty much looked lost on the offensive end. And I know a lot of times it's not flashy for people to kind of think about, okay, Fred is getting them into their sets. That's not always an easy thing to do. I'm sure people think it's an easy thing to do, but it's not always an easy thing to do. And Emma has said time after time after time that Fred is the extension of the coaching staff on the court. And you need that sometimes, especially when the Rockets are bogged down on offense and you need somebody to kind of get them going in the right sets. And that's exactly what Fred has been doing all year. And, and to kind of follow up also what Vader said, now we're seeing less of it because now Jalen is being more aggressive. He's being he has a, he's a lot more confident on the court because before we all saw it, he was hesitant. He wasn't taking advantage of certain matchups, and that's why Fred had to kind of take control. And Fred has no problem, as he said all year, letting Jalen be the main guy. He said it again last night after the game that he has no problem with Jalen being the main guy and the team you know riding Jalen Green's hot streak. So. Yeah, the whole narrative around Fred kind of being the ball hog and he's holding Jalen back, it kind of just goes with what we always see on Rockets Twitter. It always has to be kind of like a scapegoat uh, when it comes to the Rockets when they're not winning. So now that they are winning, luckily we haven't seen that narrative as much. And I think hopefully, hopefully we've kind of moved on from that. But we'll see the next time if the Rockets lose a game. I mean, maybe the Rockets don't lose a game for – at least the rest of the regular season, but we'll kind of see what happens once they actually lose a game if we kind of go back to that. But uh, hey, I want to move. Start. We are kind of seeing a scapegoat. We kind of are seeing a scapegoat. Now it's yeah. we're winning because Shingun is out. Because right? Shingun is out, <laughs> <laughs> which is a whole other topic that we can talk an entire show about. Uh, we'll actually talk a little bit about that in the second segment. But but yeah, it's kind of moved over to that now. People that weren't necessarily Shingun fans are now kind of throwing that out there, and that's a whole other stupid agenda that's getting pushed but uh i want to move on to the golden state topic before we wrap up the first segment uh, of course like i mentioned earlier golden state won again last night they're still well in the standings they're one game ahead of the rockets but they actually have the tiebreaker um so i want to ask both er, everybody here uh do y'all think that the rockets can catch golden state of course they have that big game with golden state on april 4th and if you look at the schedule if i'm not mistaken golden state out of the nine games they have remaining uh, seven of them are against teams under 500, and it's almost kind of like the reverse for the Rockets. Um, they have majority of their games are teams uh, over 500, but again, we don't really know who's going to be playing in these games, especially late in the season. But um, I'll start with you, Will. What do you think? Do you think that the Rockets do have a chance to catch Golden State despite Golden State having an easier schedule? Um, I think we have a chance for sure. Um, I think a lot of where I fall on this equation is what they do against the Mavericks. If they go out yeah. there and beat the Mavericks, I think they can realistically win a lot. I'm trying to think who else we have left, but I want to say the Mavericks are one of the tougher teams that we're going to face yeah. um, down this stretch. So if we can go out there and Jalen Green can get us past the Dallas Mavericks, I'll be a little bit more like, okay, I can see it happening. But at the same time, we're we're injured to hell and back right now. We're missing so many of our key guys. Yeah. Um, and we have a really, really tough stretch coming up where the Gold State Warriors have one of the easier stretches coming up is going to be tough. Um, I don't think it's obviously possible. I don't want to think, I don't want to say that it's not possible to do when like there's a world where the Warriors just drop a bunch of easy games, right? Like so like it's not it's definitely not over. Um 
it's still we're still very much in the running. But for me, it's like, do I want to make the playing tournament? Absolutely. Like that would that would just make my dream come true for this season. But I think we've already accomplished everything that was needed to cross the successful season threshold. I think everything we do from now is just house money. Um, and so like as long as they keep they still, they keep competing, they keep going out there and trying and, and learning and getting better every, every single day. I don't think that I'll be disappointed with any way the season ends. And Brad, yeah, I want to follow up with you. Um, the Rockets have nine games left, so do the Warriors. Uh, what record do you think the Rockets have to have to have a realistic chance of passing Golden State in those last nine games? Yeah, I'll be honest. They probably can't lose more than two games. Two is probably the max they can lose, especially with Golden State, because in that in that sense, Golden State would have to lose four of their last, you know, nine games. You know, and I don't I don't know if that'll happen. There's a new contender, you know, the Sacramento Kings are very banged up. They have six tough games coming up against one of the you know the top Western Conference standings. If they lose those six games, the Rockets own that tiebreaker. Um, so if they only lose two games the rest of the way, and the Kings lose six. They can pass them up in that regard. But, yeah, you know, when it comes to this team making the play-in, I don't necessarily know. Um, it's less to do with them and more to do with other teams. But I can say right now, them sitting at 38 and 35 is very impressive. And I went back to look because I, I can't remember in my M NBA memory um, an 11 seed being above 500. And I, I did not see a single 11 seed above 500 in the past 20 years. I, I, can, I can go back further. It was one year where that, that happened, right? Am I saying it again? Tripping, wasn't there, wasn't there one year where the West was like super duper stacked? It went back to the 10 seed. The 10 seed was okay. Was the 10 seed where it stopped? Okay, right. yeah, but I'll, I'll keep going back. I want to find an 11 10 seed that to be well, that. Good. What year was that? That, that where the 10 seed was about 500. Do you remember? Man, I think it was the 2011 2012 season. I'll have to go back and look. Yeah, because yeah, if you go back even further, like even back when the Rockets were kind of in purgatory where they were making that. They were the ninth seed with the Kyle Lowry days where they were kind of almost make the playoffs. They were still like the ninth seed. Yeah, uh, so that year. Right above the 500, yeah. Yeah, that year they were 43 and 39 on the last yeah. I was just looking at it, and they missed the playoffs, like barely. So, yeah, it reminds me of that, you know. Um, but, of course, a way different team. This team, of course, I mean, extremely young, you know, not as good in the middle of the season and taking off. I mean, there's a lot of fun young guys on the team. So, Regardless if they make the plane or not, my point being, you know, the season, in my opinion, was a success. To go from three years of poverty to above 500 basketball and, you know, two promising young stars uh, for the future, um, you have to be extremely excited, especially with the coaching staff as well. If you would have asked yeah. me this like three days ago, I would have probably given you a different answer. I feel like Orlando and Miami, like, they kind of did us dirty, man. Like, <laughs> Miami didn't play Jimmy Butler uh, when they played yeah. Golden State. And then I don't know what Orlando was doing. Like, Jalen Suggs and Paulo Banquero kind of sold that game. And so those were two games that I kind of had looked at on the schedule and said, those are Golden State Warrior losses. And they ended up winning both of those games. And I think that kind of, like, severely, severely hampered our chances. But at this point, I mean, it's kind of about us, right? So, like, we're on an 11-game winning streak. Uh, you know, we're seeing some some very special things from some of these young guys on the team. Um, you know, I think as long as they finish the season strong, you you have to keep your head up and hang your hang your head head high because like they've already to me exceeded expectations. What did what did Vegas put our put our win total on? Like thirty. It was thirty one points. Yeah, thirty one. So like we're we're probably gonna win you know over forty games. Hopefully they finish the season over five hundred. And I think if you do that. And um, Jalen continues to have a, a a good end of the season against these these playoff teams because we got we have like pretty much it's just playoff teams left, and then I think we have Utah and Portland. Um, other than that, you know, like so I'm not really like. Of course, I want to make the playoffs. I want to make that that plan tournament and kind of see what these guys do in in that situation, probably against the Lakers or whatever. But um, I mean, we're going to need a lot of help. Like Brad said, I know Sacramento. Uh, it's kind of banged up. Malik Monk looks like he hurt his MCL, you know, and you know, we don't want injuries yeah, on other teams, but, yeah. but we're 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 banged up too. We we lost our best player. We lost Tarese and you know some other guys as well. So um, I don't really necessarily feel sorry for them. You know, there's still an outside chance, but it's going to require um, some of the people in front of us to lose, and we keep winning. I'm, I'm looking at the schedule right now, and you, yeah, you're right. We um, the only two games, <clears throat> excuse me, that I look at, I'm like, okay, these are. Give me as we play Utah again, we play Portland again. These are like the uh second and third to last games of the season, so they're yeah, those are two like tanking teams right now. They're probably gonna be pulling the plug even more, um, then. Um, but yeah, we got was it uh, Dallas next, Minnesota, Golden State, Miami, Dallas again. That's a tough stretch. I think Orlando's a game that you know, I, I 
to be a toss up. And then the Clippers, which um, they're the last game of the season, and they'll probably be looking to to rest guys. I, I'd imagine yeah. probably around that time, you know, when you got a roster is. Um, oh, I guess the right word. You kind of yeah. said it in a nice way. <laughs> yeah, why PG hard? Those guys, are, you, know, you breathe on them too hard these days, they get hurt. So yeah. they, they might, you know, they might be trying to like load man's guys around that time. Um, and but I, well, I guess what I was trying to say though is, it's crazy. We're at what thirty eight wins right now, I believe. In, in yeah. that, so thirty eight, and so like I I can count two games that I think are like layups for us. So that's potentially forty wins. And then as long as we just don't lose out the rest of the way, like I think we're looking at like a season where they go forty one and forty one on like a pretty low end reasonable um, scale. And like if you would have told me this summer. And like yeah. Brady, you know, I was, I was, I was one of the people who was like from the jump playing tournament. I think this team can be a ten seed. I was, I was, I would consider myself more of an optimistic um, fan, of more like on the positive side. If you would have told me this summer that we would go forty-one and forty-one, I'd probably be like, okay, maybe I could see it, <laughs> but yeah. probably not. You know, what I'm saying we're probably gonna be like in the 36, 37, 38 range. And then if you told me that we go forty one and forty one and then don't make the playing tournament, then I wouldn't believe you at all. Like I'd be like, like how do we how do we have a record that good and we're not the ten seed? So yeah, um, yeah. yeah it, this season with you know when we lost Tari Eason, objectively he was yeah, probably and he, we lost Tari and Shingoon for the whole season that almost you know what I'm saying like I would really was like our fourth at worst our fourth best player when he went down. You can make an yeah. argument that he was our third most impactful player when he went down. And to not have him for an entire season and, and still be in a position that you're in is crazy. And to not have your best player, you know, for this this whole end stretch of the season and still be able to finish with that record, I mean, you gotta look. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's a good thing. And yeah. then we still got the Brooklyn the Brooklyn pick. Yep. Uh, that's gonna be a lottery pick. You know, we can knock on wood. Hopefully, that kind of rises and we can get like a either either like draft somebody that can contribute next season or actually package that with something and trade it and get it. You know, get somebody in here that can actually help us make a real play playoff push. I mean, I'm thinking next year. I mean, maybe I'm crazy. Y'all tell me if I'm crazy. I mean, is it is it is a top five seed next year out of the question? You know, with a fully healthy team and and then maybe like some off season addition. It's it's tough just because of just the way the West is. If, you, if we're talking about out east, I would absolutely say so. But it's just so many good teams ahead of you like the Minnesotas of the world, Denver's not going anywhere. Then you still have, you know, so many other teams that are still on the come up as just like the Rockets. So I think it's more to do with the other team, not necessarily. I think the Rockets will absolutely will be better next season. But, man, it's just so many good teams in the West. It's kind of hard to say. We've seen OKC make that jump. We saw Minnesota yeah. make that jump. I don't think anybody saw that coming. I think, I think we're next up, man. Like, if you really look at it, like these old teams, like the Lakers and – uh, you know, so the Clippers, some of these other teams that are just kind of like the Suns too. The Suns that's, that's just trying to make this last like yeah. push to like get a get a ring. And we're all like, you know, unless you don't, unless you live in those cities, like we don't look at the Phoenix Suns as being like a, a championship contender. You know what I mean? Like I don't think. Uh, I mean, me personally, I don't think the Clippers and or the Lakers, for that matter, are probably going to win a championship. I think you know, like they're just going to get worse. They're going to continue to get worse. We're con gonna continue to get better. I think there's opportunity for the Rockets to like with some with some with a good off season and then some further development from the guys we already have, like we've seen at the tail end of this season. I mean, I think we can get up in that top six. Yeah, and I kind of actually want to follow up on that on the second segment. That kind of ties into the whole Jalen Green um, part of it as well. Talk about kind of a little bit about more about the future because we all agree, you know, they make the play. We all want them to make the play-ins. They make the play-in game this year. That'd be, you know, great. But, of course, the Rockets have bigger goals going forward than just making the play-in, and that kind of ties into what we're going to talk about in the second segment. So please stick around. And welcome back to the Rocket Fuel Podcast presented by the Believe Network. And, of course, in the first segment, we talked about the Rockets' 11-game winning streak. Uh, we also talked a little bit about, of course, Jalen Green, and I want to follow up with that in the second segment. And talk a little bit more about uh, the future and if this is the real Jalen Green we can see going forward or is this more of a hot streak that we've seen for this last month. So I'll start with you, Brad, on that. Do you think that this is more along the lines of what we're going to see from Jalen Green going forward? And of course, he may not put up 35, 40 points a game, but do we think this is going to be the more consistent Jalen Green we're going to see for the rest of this year and going into the next season when they're really you know, thinking about making moves? 
Yeah, for, for the most part, you know, that's the goal. That's the hope. But I want to say the most, you know, what's <clears throat> most impressive to me is that he's getting downhill a lot better now. You know, even, yeah. again, while, while shang you know, was out there, he was getting downhill a lot better. Um, he's attacking a lot more aggressively. He's not, you know, shying away from contact. He's actually embracing contact now. That's what I like the most from him. Um, and, again, it, it all comes down to the consistencies from three-point range. To me, it's still hard to tell because – for him to, you know, be as bad as he was from three at the start of the season to now in, in this stretch of games in March just be lights out, it's like it's just, it's eye popping one. And of course, you have to say, yeah, this this kid obviously has that that star in him. But I personally, right now, can't say if if I know we'll be getting this consistently from him going going forward. I mean, every player has their hot and cold spells, but you know, you can only hope that it's going to be more so those those hot spells that we get from Jalen. But overall, um, I think what was most important was he him playing the full season so far he hasn't missed a single game and over the course yeah. of this season as a whole you know ema has been you know preaching defense all around game all around game all around game and that could be a reason why he was struggling earlier in the year you know focusing on other aspects of his game maybe tired him out uh, more so when he was trying to score um, now that it's kind of come full circle he's playing a lot better now um, and i know we always say hey you know jalen green he, he always looks better after the all-star break. The reason it looks different now is because he's playing a complete basketball game. And right now he looks like a complete basketball player while also dominating in the scoring department. So if he can carry that into next season, uh, maybe, of course, every player has their cold spells, but he's also able to you know, bounce back from a cold spell maybe in the first half, as he's been doing recently. That's what's going to be most important for him. So I do think, again, he'll only be 22 at the start of next season. I want to say James Harden was 23 when he first came to Houston. Um, this is dependent perspective how young Jalen Green is. You know, there's so much poten- untapped potential there still, um, and I think the signs are really good right now. Um, this this March has been super encouraging, and I think we'll be seeing this from him more often. I didn't know that. How old was James when he came here? 22, 23. Yeah. James was drafted in 2009. Nine. In yeah. 2012. So. Yeah, to 12, 13. I never even knew that in my mind. Yeah. 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 And, he, and he wasn't with a one of the worst teams for two straight seasons to start exactly. his career. That so that definitely helps. Absolutely. And, uh, Will, I want to follow up with you. Um, We were talking about plus minus earlier. This is uh, Jalen Green's actually had uh, seven straight, or actually during the, he hasn't had a negative plus minus since. Uh, February 29th, and that's the longest stretch of his entire career. Do you think that this is what we're going to see from Jalen Green going forward and that he's kind of maybe flipped the switch or he's figuring it out now and we're not going to see the inconsistent Jalen Green to start next season? Jalen Green is like, he, he. I mean, he's probably, he's an anomaly, man. Like, I, I really can't, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this before. Like, I've talked about this on the on the podcast for myself. It's like, I don't think I've ever seen um, a player start a season where he started, where, like, he's getting benched in crunch time. So where he's now at the, like, at the end of that same season, not only is he not getting benched, like I said, he's the reason that the team is winning. Like, I, I think yeah. we've seen players, like, Darius Garland, I think, is one of the most recent examples of guys who were, like, uh, statistically one of the worst players in the NBA and they come back and now he's an all-star caliber guy, but that took a season, you know, season and a half to get there. Jalen did it in one seat, like within the same season. So I don't really know how to answer that question. Cause I don't think we've ever, like, I don't know what to base that off of. You know what I'm saying? Like I, just, I can't think of anything in NBA history. That's like what we've seen. And then you also talk about like, when you're talking about where, where Jalen comes from, we can, we can go a step, a step further, right? He came from, he went straight from AAU high school basketball, which we know what that's about to the G League Ignite that just got shut down. What was that last week where they they, they kind of yeah. collapsed that program? Um, they feel like they feel like they weren't, you know, they were failing the kids, right? So they shut that program down. Then they he was worked to the NBA and now he's under Steven Silas, you know, with all due respect, that wasn't the like that was the structure and system that was in place back then is nothing like what it is today. And so that's like what like four years, straight years, you know, dating back to his last year in high school, where like Jalen Green was it wasn't it wasn't the environment that a player like him needed to be in, and so now he's in a in an environment where there's structure, where there's where there's, um, you know, there's a point guard in play, there's a coach in play, like you know, there's there's yeah. we he has everything he needs to succeed right now, and he's doing so. Um, you know, it took him a minute to get there, but now he's there. Um, for me, what makes this maybe slightly more encouraging, and why I believe that I would err on the side of I think this is just who he is now, not just another like end of the year streak. Is the fact that like it's, it's the plus minus is the fact that he's doing it. You can't say it's empty stats anymore, right? And then on top, not even just empty stats, but like he's like Baden touched on earlier, he's impacting the game on every metric. Like I haven't, we watch the games all live. 
I cannot remember the last time where I'm like, ah, Jalen, what are you doing on defense? I said all the time, yeah. like, Jalen, who you guarding, Jalen? What you doing, Jalen? Jalen's not only – I don't say that no more. I think Jalen's played really good defense these last – like this this month and a half or so. Like, I, I I don't think I can recall any possession where I'm – I'm complaining about Dylan Brooks defense right now. I'm not complaining about Dylan no more, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I think that Jalen's playmaking has been has been really um, – Really still lately. like the, the play he made to Jabari to send the game. Well, I wouldn't send the game to OT, but kind of put us up three against the Thunder uh, two nights ago. Like that's a that that's a simple play, you know, the scheme of thing, but man, that's huge for me because like that's a it's a play that shows growth. That's a play that he wouldn't make last year. Um and so I guess what makes it more real to me is his game's a lot more complete now and it's translating to wins that he is like almost directly responsible for. Um and so that may makes it a little different, but like I said, I I don't know, bro. Like, it, I hope, I hope it is. I, I, I just yeah. don't know. I saw somebody say, like, and it, it just make made me laugh. They were like, "How do you go from being like a bottom five player in the NBA to a top five player in the NBA in the same, in the same season?" season. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laugh because it, it. I mean, it's just kind of like, like Will said, it's kind of unprecedented. It's kind of absurd when you think about the fact that, and and when we say he's a top five player in the NBA right now over the past month, that is not even. That's not even hyperbole. That's not exaggerating. Like, because if you look at his plus minus, you look at uh, like his overall impact. He's one player a week. He's probably, uh, you know, he's the top two candidate for player of the month right now. Uh, And there's been several different websites that have said, "Hey, Jalen Green has been the best player like statistically in our database this past week, these past two weeks, or whatever." So like, this is not this is not just us gassing it or whatever. Um, I don't know. Like I. I kind of feel like listening to um, like Emi Adoka talk about him. He was like, um, and this is very recently. I don't know if this was the last press conference or the previous one, but he was just basically talking about how he was not <clears throat> like this whole thing with, with Jalen Green has been a process. And he was like, he, you know, all young players do not, you know, reach the same, you know, understanding and, and ability to like kind of like implement the game plan at, at the same pace. It takes some guys longer. Sometimes some yeah. guys never get it. But I think when you get it, you get it. You know what I mean? Like you can't go back from like, I now I understand this coverage. Now suddenly I don't understand it anymore. You know what I mean? Or I understand like um, how to how to think the game. And I think Jalen's thinking the game a little bit better now. I also think that we've seen situations in the past where he starts a game slow and we're like, oh, it's going to be a Jalen stinker, right? We know he's not coming back from this. He missed he missed his first four shots, first five shots or whatever. It's going to be a bad game. And I, I don't – I still worry about it, but I don't necessarily think that anymore. And we saw a perfect example yesterday where he had four points in the first half. He was, like, kind of invisible. <laughs> I think Craig Ackerman even said it on the broadcast. And then he came out in the third quarter and dropped 20. And so yeah. I don't know. Like, I kind of feel like – um to some degree, like the hot shooting is not going to be this hot. He's, but um, as far as like um, him understanding where his guys are on the floor, him understanding where he can attack, him understanding we one of the things we always complained about earlier in the season, he don't he don't know where to get his shots off. Like he's super fast, he's super athletic, but like every every like dynamic go to scorer kind of knows where to get to on the floor in order to get what they want. And it's almost like Jalen didn't have it. And I kind of feel like he has that now. He kind of has kind of like a go-to. Um, he does the little hezzy thing and the between the leg thing. It, it kind of gets him where he wants to go. And once he gets downhill and going to the basket, it kind of opens up the, the shooting for him. He gets hot. You know, he gets confident. So, um, no, do I think he's going to average 30 next season, <laughs> 33, whatever he's been averaging yeah. over the last seven games? No. But, hey, that, that, that may be a high-level outcome for him a few years from now. But – yeah, I think he's kind. Of, I think he, he. I think he gets it now. And um, one other thing, like I think it was Gary Payton kind of mentioned, um, when guys start playing defense and being asked, asked and required to play defense for the first time, it takes your legs away, and so that does kind of affect uh, some of the other things you need yeah. to do. And so, like I think you know, he's hit his he's hit his stride now, and hopefully, this is this is who he is now. Yeah, absolutely. And MA requires that for you to even be on the court. So that's definitely a good point there. And before we wrap up the show, I want to kind of follow up on that. And it kind of leads me into the last question. Uh, of course, we saw the reports from actually multiple places saying about the Rockets, you know, looking into, you know, if they can bring in a, a you know, whatever, a star level or whatever player that they may look into moving one of Jalen or Al Alperin because for some reason now people don't think they can play together, even though, like Vader said earlier, they had plenty of games earlier in the year or even right before Alperin went out where they were actually 
um, both play well in the same game. And it's just something that the Rockets, uh, that's a good problem to have to try to figure out. But I, I want to start with you, Will. Uh, do, let me, I, I'm trying to find the best way to phrase this question. <laughs> Is there what would it take for you to trade either Jalen or Alper? And are we talking about an all NBA type level player? Or are you not even really considering in you know the fact that both of them are 22 and younger? Are you even considering even trading them for anybody in the league right now? Look, the, the worst player I'd probably trade Jalen or Shingoon for right now might be Luca. That might be the worst okay. player. Um he I said the worst is Luca. So you know, I'm like the worst. I'm struggling, I'm struggling with <laughs> like, like top three in the league. Do I want to <laughs> trade him for Tatum? That's that's that was the name I was struggling with before. Remember like a Devin yeah. Booker, like someone that I don't know, but um no, I don't I don't I wouldn't I'm not like the Donovan Mitchell thing, that was the the big one yeah. this season, and I was like, Man, no, like I I don't think that's a good idea. Um mainly because you also gotta realize it wouldn't just be Jalen for this guy, it would be Jalen plus yeah. probably Cam or Tari or something like that, plus three to four draft picks for one guy. And it's like um for as talented as is you know the Donovan Mitchells and the Lori Markinins and the Mikhail Bridge, like those guys are very talented players, but one, they're what Donovan Mitchell's probably the youngest in that group. I mean, I think Lori actually might be, but he's what 26, 27. Yeah. So he's you know, these guys are like in their primes right now. Um, and our best player, Alper Shingun, is what 21? He's 21 years old, he'll be 22 in, in July, June, something like that. So, like, the timelines are about five, six years apart. You're talking about trading away, like I said, pretty much the vast majority, not all of the drive capital you've accumulated. You're trading away another young player, probably in that package as well. I just don't think that it's necessary. I think that you could, um, run it back. With the team that we have next year, we have, you know, they, they talk about the course. We have six very talented young players. Yeah. Uh, we have a slew of draft picks so to add to that, to assist in building around that group. Um, and, and like we've been touching on all this, uh, this whole podcast, like we're going to win probably 40 plus games. And we did that with Tari Eason out the lineup for two thirds of the season. Shingun missed the last like almost what 20 games or so of the season, something like that. Uh, Jalen Green, um, was unplayable <laughs> at times for like half the yeah. season. So like, there's so many things that just didn't go our way. I mean, I can, I can honestly keep listing things that didn't go our way this season, right? But there were so many things that, that just did not go our way this year. And somehow, some way, in the first year of our head coach, and these guys are, uh, I mean, they're still babies in this league. They found a way to win forty or forty some games, right? Like, if if that's the like season that like a lot of stuff did not go right, and this is the this is the start. Well, I mean, like, I see no reason why you shouldn't believe that in a year or two, you know, as these guys continue to to grow and develop and, and you know what I'm saying, uh, you don't get more time with them. Like Vader said, I don't think it's unrealistic to say that this team is 45, 47 wins next year. Like, probably more. I mean, I wouldn't even shocked if it was more than that, to be honest with you, uh, given how this is, like, if they stay healthy, this what we saw this season was the baseline. So I'm not necessarily looking to trade off of them. I think that they complement each other like this Jalen and Shingo. I think they complement each other perfectly. I don't really get the idea that like they somehow are like holding each other back. I, I mean, I, I talk about it a lot. Not to say that they, these guys are like the one to one examples, but like Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic exist. De'Aaron Fox and Sabonis exist. Kobe and Paul Gasol exist. Like these are countless examples of throughout the NBA history of, of like the guard, the athletic guard who gets downhill. And then the 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 big who super duper high Q, who you know who just makes plays happen like that is a duo that we have watched in NBA. We're still watching it right now. We watched it, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. It still happens. And so like I don't really get the idea that like that this duo can't can't coexist either. So no, I'm not. I like I said, it would take a lot for me to trade off of Jalen and Shingo right now. So I I think the answer is just no. Yeah, and, and what about you, Brad? Because like Will said, basically it would take a top three player for to even consider trading them. I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, realistically, it comes down to what star is going to be available. Yeah. And at this current point in time, you know, you even had Donovan Mitchell, I think as, I think today even said, he, he wasn't worried about, you know, the future right now. I just want to focus on the season when asked about, you know, contract talk. So he's probably the name you're looking at, the best name on the market that would probably be available. Like him, a Trey Young maybe. 
you know, just, just keeping it realistic. And, and, and if we're keeping it realistic, there's not a name on the board right now that I'm giving up for Alper Sangoon or Jalen Green because his potential outweighs, you know, both of those guys' potentials outweigh, the, you know, the kind of player you can get in the trade. And as Will mentioned, you're not just giving up those two players, you know, one for one. There's also additional pieces you have to add on to it as well. Yeah. And the Rockets are in a good spot now. Of course, good young core six. You have the Brooklyn picks. Uh, the Brooklyn pick this year is probably going to be the ninth, eighth pick. Um, it was going to be eighth for a while, but Toronto is losing on purpose. So probably the ninth is pick right now. And then, of course, um, further picks after that. So I, I just look at everything they have as a whole, and I just can't give up on a single thing they have. I, I, I bring the young core six back next year. I run it back. And you see what you can do because you haven't seen it, – it'd be foolish, in my opinion, to – trade off your two young stars before seeing what they can do in a playoff setting, you know, because you don't, you don't know yet. We haven't necessarily seen this Jalen Green with Alperin Shangun yet. Um, and there's nothing to suggest in my eyes that Jalen can't do this next to Alperin Shangun. So if I get these two guys who in my eyes are two of the top four players in that stack 2021 draft class, um, if you get those two guys, you know, playing at the same level, if not better, you know, with an extra off season of work in a playoff setting, um, let's see what they can do before any irrational moves are made. Um, I, I'd at least have to see that. So, yeah, there's, there's not a single name on the market um, that I'm trading one of the, the Rockets' young stars for. It, it'd just be illogical to me, especially before seeing what they could do in a big setting. And kind of uh, continuing your thought, Brad, like we haven't seen Shingun with shooters around him. We haven't seen him. We haven't seen what he can really do when he's getting double and triple teamed. And there's a, you know, a, a Trey Murphy out there that you can kick the ball out to. You know what I mean? Like, we, there is so much improvement that this, like, we have a good roster. But if, if we're now talking about, like, filling out the roster and building around these two guys, um, now you got to start looking at, like, what is your role, right? And I think um, if you got, if you put shooters and defenders around Shingun and around Jalen, you, you, you have something. You have something there. So, uh, trading them, man, it would take a lot. I mean, Victor Wimbanyama is not walking through that door, right? <laughs> Denver's not gonna give us Jokic. Uh, realistically, I mean, even if even if Dallas had to trade Luca, Mark Cuban is not going to trade him to Houston. No, he way. would take a he would take a, worse, <laughs> he would take a worse deal to send him anywhere other than Houston. He's not coming here, guys. So I don't know, man. Like if you really start looking at guys like like Donovan Mitchell, now that I've seen Jalen Green's high. I've seen Donovan Mitchell's high. Like, is 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 Donovan Mitchell's high worth trading J Jalen Green, who's way younger, and then also attaching assets to that, right? And then, like, I really, I'm a, I'm a, now the the only guy who I think maybe Mike could ever hit the trademark, and I just don't even these these are just unrealistic people. Jason Tatum, right? Yeah, like, man. okay, I'm listening, I'm listening, but like, he's not getting traded. <laughs> I don't think he's getting traded. And so, like, if we're just talking about, like, minor upgrades for guys who are way older and you're also giving up that player and draft capital, it just does not seem to make sense. So I think the Rockets should kind of, like, look at the look at the pieces that are surrounding the guys rather than look at those two guys. I think Shingun should be here. Jalen Green should be here. There's some other guys on the team who I'm really high on, like a man, for example, who I think should not be included in any trade, any trade talks either. But, um, you know, there are more – was the GM who I kind of like, I, I watched a lot and he, he kind of always had, you know, everybody's available kind of thing, you know, like I'm, my job is to make the team better. So in a sense, uh, Raphael Stone kind of has to have that kind of mindset, but also not be as impersonal as Daryl Morey was because he did burn a lot of bridges, but you know, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately your job is to make the Houston Rockets a, a championship contender. And sometimes that requires making the hard decisions. I don't think Alfred Shingun or Jalen Green should be included in any of those tough decisions. But, like, there's some other guys on the team who I really like, who I really would hate to see go. But, hey, I mean, at the end of the day, what is, what's the ultimate goal? Yeah, it's, it's the win. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Of course, we're still in this season, and Rockets still have a chance to make the play. And before we wrap up the show, I want to give – get each one of y'all opinion on this real quickly. Uh, so, of course, the Rockets take on the Mavericks tomorrow. Uh, do you think the Rockets make that 12 in a row? Who I'll say this. Um, the one downside of having Alper Sengun out is you, you, you definitely lack bigs. And Dallas is 12 and 0 right now, I want to say, when, when uh, Luca and Gafford start. I think that was a stat that I saw. Yeah, I saw that too. Um, 
yeah, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough. And not only do they have Gafford, they also have Derek Lively. Yeah. Um, and and the, those guys aren't the players they are unless they have a Luka Doncic feeding in the rock. A guy like Kyrie. They got Gafford and Lively, but we got Jock Landale. We got Jock Lando, who's playing, who's playing crazy. So we'll, we'll see. That's, that's, it's, that's it's, gonna take, it's gonna take a, a, a huge effort from the whole entire squad. It can't just be Jalen. You know, it's, it's got to be everybody. And luckily, they're at home, and they're twenty six and eleven at home. So I'll give the Homer answer and say yes, even though I don't know. <laughs> but I'll, I'll say yes. Wait, 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 tomorrow. Yeah, at yes. home. Okay, that, that that gives us a little little boost. I, I was for my answer, bro. Vader knows I I jinx things. I don't think I've, <laughs> I've never really been on the right side of these kind of situations. So I'm I'm a, I'm gonna plead the fifth here because I, I won't all right, I, we'll let you slide on that if that's the case. Uh, what about you, Vader? It's gonna take like a Herculean effort by like at least three guys on the team. We can't have Dylan Brooks and Fred coming out and shooting shooting ducks. You know what I mean? Like they we gotta we have to be knocking down threes. Uh, we got to be locking up defensively. Like, so a lot of things going to have to be right. I mean, if we're just looking at like where we are right now, Dallas is a little bit ahead of us. They're a better team than us. We are at home. So like you said, that does give us a boost because like up until recently, we've been like absolutely terrible on the road. Um, so I'll give us a puncher's chance. I mean, if I, ha- I'm not, I don't gamble much. Right. Cause I like yeah, to keep yeah. my money in my pocket, but in my bank account, but so if I, if I had to bank money and put money on it, I would probably I hate to say this, but I think Dallas is going to win. But I, I do think we have a chance to shock the world and and make it make it twelve straight wins. Yeah, the Rockets actually played Mavericks pretty well, but but like like I was saying earlier, you know they they've added pieces like you know like Gaff or like PJ Washington. And so, I wanted I wanted him to so, um, yeah Gafford man he was yeah. though, man. so so they are definitely a much better team and they won six in a row. If I had to go with it, just because like you said they do play a lot better at home, even though they've been playing well in a row, I have to go with them winning tomorrow. Now against Minnesota, that's a different story because they always struggle against Minnesota, and even without Carl Anthony Town, Minnesota's tough. But um, if I had to go with it, I think the Rockets can pull it out tomorrow. But it's going to be a great game regardless. Like one of the biggest games we've seen around here in years. So uh, that would definitely be interesting. Before we wrap the show, I want to give Brad and Will another chance to let everybody know that we'll find all their great content. Yeah, so again, Brado NBA on Instagram and Twitter. I'm a lot more active now on Instagram if you guys want to you know, tap in there. Um, you know, as Will and I were saying earlier, you know, the playback room is very fun. We have Vader coming on there as well. You know, we're live streaming every single game, so, so that's a great time. And then lastly, of course, the podcast, Brad on Will Show. We've been dropping a lot more. I'm um, hoping to drop every Monday from here on out. But, yeah, I want to thank you both for, for having me on. First time on the show. I had a, had a great time. Yeah, uh, I'll echo the same sentiment. Uh, we appreciate y'all for having us on the show. Um, I had a good time recording with y'all. Um, and I'm going to give y'all, y'all flowers too, man. Y'all been doing some of the big things, really good things as well. Um, but to see two black men uh, prospering. So, uh, with that, you know what I'm saying? Y'all can find me on uh, Instagram, Twitter. I'm going to try to do TikTok again. I'm going to try to get back on there um, at Bias Houston. Um, and, yeah, Brad talked about the podcast and the, the playback room, and that, that's really it for me. And, again, man, we appreciate y'all coming on. Man. Y'all doing big things. And I'm definitely happy to see what y'all been doing. Like I said, we've been working together, you know, on and off for a long time now. I guess long time in terms of Twitter years, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. So, yeah. So, man, it's good to see y'all doing your thing, and I appreciate y'all coming on for sure. Absolutely. Anytime. And of course, Vader, I got to thank you, my co-host. I appreciate you coming on as usual. Oh, yeah. It was a good time. Like the, my, the, my brother. So it was fun to have him on as well. So, yeah, it was a, it was a very a good a good show, in my opinion. Uh, we need to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. And as usual, we appreciate all y'all that support us. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure you subscribe. Also, give us a like and let us know down in the comments. Do you think that Jalen Green is taking that next step and that he can be more consistent going forward? And let us know, do you think the Rockets can make it 12 in a row tomorrow against the Dallas Mavericks? As usual, we appreciate your support. Make sure you check out the next episode of Rockets Fuel Podcast.